and welcome back to the Meet the Translator podcast. My name is Dot and today I'll be chatting to Dr. Severin Hoopshire davidson about mental health for translators. Severin is a senior lecturer in translation studies at the Open University and she's done lots of research on translation psychology and issues of well-being in the translation professions. Severine will share why she chose to focus on this area and what some of her findings are, as well as why it's important for us as translators to take care of our mental health and some things we can do to manage our moods and emotions. It's a really interesting and beneficial topic, so grab a drink or take your dog out for a walk and enjoy the episode. Hi Severine, thank you so much for coming on my podcast today. It's really nice to have you here. Could you share a bit about yourself, what you do, and your path to becoming a senior lecturer in translation studies? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, It's my pleasure to be here. I'm really honoured to be invited. Mm -hmm. And it's a new opportunity for me because I've never done a podcast before. Um, (laughs) So yeah, I'm delighted to, um, to take part. I suppose, where did it all start? Um, My interest in translation studies was sparked during my master's in translation interpreting at the University of Bath. I was interested in why we were all kind of producing completely different translations of the same text. And so I was interested in kind of this impact of individual differences on translation performance that I think was beyond kind of uh, linguistic knowledge or um, subject knowledge. And so I kind of wanted to pursue that and to do some research around that. And so that's why I started a a, a PhD in the area of translators' individual differences. And then I wasn't sure what to do after, but the best way to continue doing the research was to get an academic job. So I became a lecturer. Um, I lectured at the University of Salford, um, translation (laughs) interpreting, and then at Aston University, And now I'm at the Open University, where I've had the opportunity to create and launch the MA in translation there. So I guess career progression got me to where I am today. That's that's is I love that you like went down the whole research route and were like right how can I keep <laughs> finding out more about this it's um, obviously I know. something that you it totally wasn't about the teaching I mean I love teaching uh, and luckily mm-hmm. I discovered that I did but for me it was definitely about pursuing the research yeah mm-hmm. the way that I found you I I came across your um, position statement that you wrote for the Institute of uh, Translation Interpreting about translators mental health and well-being which is why I wanted to talk to you <laughs> specifically about yeah mental health for translators basically and as you said about enjoying research I know that you've done quite a bit of research surrounding mental health for translators why is it that you chose to focus on this specific area? Uh, That's a good question. I mean, translators' emotions and mental health has always been interesting to me. And I've been wanting professional associations to adapt their codes of practice and, and to kind of include mental health in that for some time. But I think it was really probably the pandemic that convinced or really convinced professional bodies that this was a topic that needed attention, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yes, the ITI asked me to draft this statement. I mean, although I think to some extent this topic was a little bit more visible in interpreting contexts, probably due to the kind of face-to-face nature of interpreting, translators' Mm -hmm. mental health, I think, wasn't really a topic of investigation, neither really in translation studies, so in the research area, but it didn't really feature either in professional conferences or uh, CPD, continuing professional development, although Um, I'd noticed that some literary translators had mentioned it in some of their writings, so they'd written some pieces talking about emotions, but it didn't, it wasn't very popular. And I kind of started getting more and more interest from practicing translators when I spoke about emotions at conferences. So I would go and present my research and they would come to me and and tell me about their experiences. And it just started to really convince me that this was a very worthwhile topic uh, to research and that it kind of needed more visibility. Mm -hmm. And in parallel to that, I was doing um, an MSc in psychology um, because I've always been interested in, in psychological topics. And so as I was working my way through this master's, I started 
kind of being introduced to more and more relevant concepts and theories that I thought, oh, this applies to translators or this could help them or this could, mm-hmm. you know, help to explain some of their feelings or some of their reactions in the job. So, yeah, it's kind of a convergence of lots of different reasons that kind of led me um, to where I am right now. Yeah, I I, um, I recently went to the ITI conference and it was my first ever official translation conference that I went to. And I so it was interesting to see that there were a few talks about mental health and stuff. But obviously for me being my first conference, I didn't know that that would have like, I don't know how it would have been in the past. So it's interesting to hear that it's it's good that it's being talked about more now. Definitely. I would say definitely it's something that's been more and more kind of in in the limelight over the last five to ten years, probably. But Mm -hmm. in in broader terms, it's quite recent. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, So can you tell me a bit more about the research that you've done and um, what you found? Yeah, I mean, I suppose... um, My initial findings were linked to my PhD, so um, I did some research, so I investigated how 20 uh, poor MA students at the University of Bath, my little guinea pigs, bless them, they were so nice (laughs) um, to to volunteer to participate in my research. And so um, I recruited 20 of them, so MA students, and I asked them to translate a literary text. And at the same time, I also collected data on their experience, their personalities, and so on. And one of my main findings through this piece of research was that translators who had an intuitive personality trait, according to a psychometric test um, uh, that, I, that I'd done with them, the ones who had this intuitive personality trait performed that literary translation task more successfully than the ones who didn't have that, that personality trait um, mm-hmm. and more successfully in relation to uh, anonymous marking by four different people. And so there was that kind of interesting finding and I thought, hmm. Um, and that led me to kind of looking at other kinds of individual differences. So over the years, I've looked at ambiguity tolerance, for instance. I've looked at emotional intelligence. And I started to see some patterns, particularly with emotions and how being able to kind of handle these in translation could really influence job satisfaction and job success. And mm-hmm. so in, I guess, over 2013, 2014, which seems ages for you probably, but for me it still feels quite recent, um, I carried out some field work with approximately 150, 155 um, professional translators. And I collected data on their job satisfaction, their job success in terms of, you know, how many prizes they might have won, that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. their years of experience, their age, other factors. And I also collected information on their emotional intelligence according to um, a psychological test. And what I found is that there are kind of positive correlations between high levels of emotional intelligence, so being able to perceive emotions, to regulate emotions, being able to express emotions. So high levels of that correlated positively with a number of indicators of success in in the translation profession and with job Mm -hmm. satisfaction as well. So more recently, that's kind of led me to think, oh, actually, you know, Emotions and and being able to manage emotions seems to be something quite important for translators. And that's led me to create and to design some courses um, on the topic of emotion management that are more Mm -hmm. tailored to translators. And that's because there are courses and things out there um, on emotion management more generally. But the literature says that things have to be like these courses have to be tailored to particular contexts to be effective. So I Mm -hmm. thought we needed something more kind of specifically aimed at translators. That's interesting. I didn't know that you had the the course as well. That's quite cool. So how does a translator's emotional intelligence actually affect their work? Oh, gosh, Um, in a number (laughs) of different ways, I would say. So one example is there's been quite a lot of research around moods. Um, And so there's evidence out there that your mood can influence the translation decisions that you make. And so some studies have um, been carried out where mood induction was used. So they put translators into particular moods, either kind of more positive or more negative moods. And there are different ways that that they did that. Um, 
this tends to be kind of a little bit artificial, right? It's kind of lab-based studies. But the results are really interesting. Um, and so one of those really fascinating things is that what they found, and that's been found in several studies, when translators are in a positive mood, generally, that increases their creativity in translation. Um, mm -hmm. But, so that's a good thing, but because they're um, in a good mood, they're also a little bit more confident. And so they pay less attention to kind of nitty gritty details. So they're, they're a bit less perf of a perfectionist, I guess, when they're, when they're in a really positive mood. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, when translators are, are put into a negative mood, it's been shown that they're less creative, but they tend to carry out more um, analytical processing. So that means they pay much greater attention to detail and to the nitty gritty stuff. So I think that's really quite interesting. And it shows that, you know, it's not just positive emotions are good for you and, and negative emotions mm -hmm. are bad for you. They both have kind of pros and cons to them. Um, mm -hmm. And what the research, I think, really showed is that translators process emotions differently depending on their moods and they process text differently depending on their moods as well. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of emotion, emotional intelligence more generally, that impacts a lot of different um, aspects of one's work and um, so it can impact your emotion perception, so how you kind of perceive the emotions from a source text for instance. Um, how you understand them and, and how you um, you feel them. And then it can impact the way in which you regulate emotions. So, you know, people who are quite good emotion regulators will be able to, to cope with and to deal with quite difficult emotions more easily. They'll have coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then people who don't will, will struggle to deal with that and that can impact their, their translation work negatively. And then it also, emotional intelligence also impacts emotion expression. So the way in which you uh, speak about emotions, the vocabulary, the language that you use, it also impacts other things like your levels of empathy. Um, but one thing that I find really interesting as well is this, this, this idea that lots and lots of emotional intelligence is really good, but actually it depends on the context, it depends on the situation, mm -hmm. and it's good to have empathy, for instance, but too much empathy can also be a problem because it can prevent you from, from doing other aspects of a job successfully. So, yeah, I think it's about it's about balance and, and context. Mm. It's, it's interesting that you say that about about the mood because I guess, well, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it'd be good then like to do your translation in a good mood so that you can be all creative and then proofread it in a bad mood so that you can get all the nitty gritty bits or something I like that. that. Like, <laughs> I think like knowing, knowing things like this and maybe also knowing uh, our emotional intelligence as translators could maybe help us decide what, what kind of work is good for us and what kind of work we should do depending on what mood we're in and what we're going to be more successful at depending on our mood and everything because like the emotional intelligence one is also quite interesting because I guess it your kind of success with that would vary depending on the kind of work you're doing because if you're doing like a really creative literary text or something that's going to be completely different to working on like I don't know a technical manual of a lawnmower or <laughs> you know something like that where it's not probably going to have as much emotion in it, yeah. you'd assume <laughs> Although I've been told, don't discount boredom. <laughs> That's an emotion as well. Um, and that also can also influence, you know, how you work. Mm -hmm. But I think you make a really good point about, you know, the, the choice of, of text and, and, you know, thinking about the emotion that you're in or the mood that you're in and how that might impact on the work that you do. I think it's interesting because there's kind of this idea that, there could be a, a major difference in performance, right? When translators are enjoying or, or not enjoying what they're working on. And I th I'd say that the question is, is more complex than that as well. And it's got deeper levels because you could quite easily be working on a text that you're not enjoying and or like you're in a bad mood and, and you're hating every aspect of it. You could be experiencing mm -hmm. sadness or anger while you're doing it. But there might be a greater purpose or a greater goal or some positive emotion that comes out in the end. So sometimes, you know, there are kind of those temporary emotions and then there are, you know, emotions that are broader, I suppose, or more long lasting. So it, it's quite it's quite complex as a, as a topic to get into. I think there's no kind of one answer to it. And I mm -hmm. think also translators 
have very different coping mechanisms, which can help them regulate their feelings um, and limit the impact um, or the negative impact of, of their feelings on their work. But I think generally you're right. If, if we think about studies in psychology and, and, and research that's been published in the psychology literature, um, you know, job satisfaction is really important. And the literature suggests that if you enjoy your work a majority of the time, <laughs> that's really important for career sustainability. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's unlikely that, you know, a translator who doesn't enjoy their translation work is going to stay in the profession. So that is something to bear in mind. And I think, you know, there are some quite telling examples in the literature of translators who don't enjoy their work or didn't enjoy working on particular translations and that has had important consequences for their well-being. One example that I provide sometimes when I talk about this issue is the academic and literary translator Carol Meyer mm -hmm. and she basically uh, translated between Spanish and English and she uh, wrote some really quite powerful accounts of her experiences of translating authors whose work actually made her physically ill. And every time she would go back to those translations, she'd get headaches and she'd feel he like her limbs would feel heavy. And because she didn't align with, you know, what what the authors were saying or, or what the texts were about or it triggered something in her. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, it's, it's important to kind of be aware of that as well in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, enjoying the work that you do. Yeah, for sure. And like, I think it's something... With so many translators being freelancers as well, I mean, I think it's good because we do get to pick and choose a lot of the time what we work on. Obviously, when you first start out, it can be a bit more difficult and you're just kind of trying to get work. But like as you develop, like you can choose, find out what you like and work on the things you enjoy. I mean, I'm, I've am i been uh, freelancing for about three and a half years now and I'm still learning like <laughs> which things are good for me and which aren't. And I find it harder sometimes because I'm a subtitler as well. Like not that long ago, I worked on a on a series that I was subtitling and there were bits in it that I thought I was going to be physically sick, like working on it. And I was just kind of like, you know, this is not this is not for me. And obviously I finished off the project, but I kind of made a mental note like, OK, I'm not going to work on this kind of content. It obviously isn't isn't right for me. But I think like it is something that we as translators like do need to be aware of and remember like which things which things we enjoy and it's actually something that like when I make my spreadsheet um where I write down like the client the project the like how much I make or whatever for each project I also put a rating out of 10 on like the enjoyment <laughs> because you um, don't always remember like <laughs> you don't always remember yeah. it so I just have like out of 10 and then when I look back over the year or over the month or whatever I can be like okay oh, yeah, I want to do more of this kind of project like <laughs> I love that that's so reflective and shows real awareness on your part and this is yeah this is so important because I feel like we don't talk about it in training so you know when we do masters in translation um, we don't often talk about emotions and I've had so much mm -hmm. feedback from former students you know who have said I had no idea I would be sent a text like this or I didn't I didn't know that I would be in this situation that I'd, would react in this way or that this would trigger something. So, you know, we talk about other aspects in, in our translation programs that are important, like ethics, for instance, and it's, it can mm -hmm. be linked. Um, but emotions are, are very rarely discussed. And I feel like it's important for us as educators, really, or, or translators who work as mentors, for instance, to kind of tackle these issues and to help, you know, new translators into the press. To pr profession to think about these issues and to okay what are you comfortable with what would you allow into yourself because it's mm -hmm. that's what it is you're allowing these texts into you you're processing them on such a deep level you know you need to think about what you're okay with <laughs> um mm -hmm. so yeah no what you what you said makes a lot of sense yeah and I mean it's something that you kind of have to work with and learn along the way as well because you don't always know what's gonna trigger you until it happens and <laughs> like <laughs> yeah and I think I think being aware of the potential impact of translating certain texts is really important. 
and checking in with oneself quite regularly, like you do with your spreadsheet. I think it's one of these things, It's you often hear, um, like for example, when you go on the plane, they always say, you know, put your oxygen mask on first before helping others. And mm-hmm. I think that it's the same with translators and, and with mental health, right? So if you're taking care of your emotional well-being, acknowledging your feelings about certain texts, about certain situations regularly, then you're in a better position to perform your job well. You have this awareness and you know going into it, you know, whether or not you choose to go into it, but but you have this awareness of, of, um, of what's happening and what it might do to you. And I think... Another thing is I've also had kind of this feedback that, you know, but translators can also experience lots of positive emotions and love their job. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's really important to recognize that. And I think the reason why um, uh, we as human beings, right, tend to focus on, on negative, on the negative aspects, it's because it's quite powerful and tends to stay with us. And that's actually, that's ev- evolutionary. Um, so we're much more likely to focus on negative emotions and we focus a lot of our cognitive resources on mm-hmm. problems and on negative emotions because, you know, we have to solve these. These are these are issues that are vital for us. And it, in an evolutionary sense, we've always focused on the negative. Um, but that's why it's draining because we cognitive, you know, cognitively we process so much with negative emotions. So although you may experience and you will experience, you know, positive emotions more often than negative ones, probably in the context of your job, the mm-hmm. negative ones are more likely to knock you sideways <laughs> and mm-hmm. to be quite unexpected. Um, and so I think taking care of your mental health isn't something that you just do when you're dealing with negative stuff. It's something that you you just have to think about all the time, even when you don't think you need to, because that's what is building your resilience for when the hard times come, because they will come, even if they're rare. Yeah. (laughs) So would you say, like, with the research you've done and everything, would you say that overall, for us translators, that it's really important to take care of our mental health in order to produce you know high quality translations and succeed in our work I think so I mean uh, you know as I said I think it's a question of protecting yourself as well and if you take care of your mental health then you're more likely to give the best of yourself to the important work that you do Mm -hmm. so yeah I think it's it's one of those things that is gaining increasing visibility in a lot of professions. Um, I know that in academia, for instance, in universities where, you know, there's an increase, increasing emphasis on mental health and mental health webinars and all the rest of it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think mental health is very individual and it means different things to different people and it can't really be imposed on you. I think Mm -hmm. you need to figure out kind of, you know, what will protect your mental health and it will be different things um, for different people. And so there are different mm-hmm. kind of things that you can do. Mm-hmm. I think it's, you know, it's one of those things that's quite individual because people do often ask, you know, what can I do like practically and what works for someone won't necessarily work for someone else. Right. So one mm-hmm. of the things that often I find quite funny is meditation because a lot of people say oh meditation is an ideal way to manage your emotions and I cannot do it I have tried <laughs> I don't know about you Dot. I don't know if meditation is something that you you do have you I tried mean, it I've, I've I've tried it um I've done it a few times I don't actively practice it I'm more into yoga which is it's not meditation but it's kind of like it kind of touches on it I feel like um Definitely. The, Definitely. Body movements. So that's kind of more my thing than just meditation. But yeah, <laughs> I've never tried yoga. I probably need to get into that. Yeah. So again, you know, yoga might work for you. Meditation may not as well. Meditation may work wonders for other people. You know, I think some people. So one thing that I read recently in an article I thought was really good is before doing a really difficult translation, the translator would mm-hmm. put their favorite perfume on and have that kind of s- smell, oh. that positive smell. And I, I'd never thought of doing something like that, but I thought that was really mm-hmm. nice. Um, you know, it could be making sure that you take regular breaks, going for walks. Um, it could be having a picture of your pets, you know, on your next to your screen, something like that. I mm-hmm. think in terms of... of perhaps more more long-term or kind of deeper things that can be done, I think it's important to ask yourself quite regularly what your key values are. 
Um, and just to think about whether the work that you're doing aligns with those values most of the time. It may not always, mm -hmm. but probably a majority of the time, your work needs to align with your values for you to be kind of stress-free. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that you can do quite regularly because values change over time. You know, you have different priorities in your life over, over time. And you can do this with your long-term goals as well. So, you know, ask yourself what your goals are for your career, your long-term goals, and see whether the translation work that you're doing at the moment aligns with those goals as well. Mm -hmm. um, and both of those ideas, I think, is, it, it's this idea of like stepping back from your day-to-day -day and thinking about the wider picture um, in terms mm -hmm. of your work. And it's important to make space for that in your day or in your week. Um, you know, quite often people think they're too busy to do that or that it feels indulgent somehow. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of a problem with implementing positive mental health. People often think, oh, I don't have time for it or it, it's on the back burner. But I feel that it needs to be prioritized. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't have to be very long. It can be half an hour in your weekend. It can be, you know, 10 minutes with your coffee in the mornings. But, you know, thinking about those wider issues, I think, will really improve your, your mental health. When I was going through quite a difficult time recently myself, I tried an exercise that I'd read about, which was, I'll just share it here because it might, it might be interesting for others, identify three to five things that would make your day successful. So mm -hmm. in the morning, before you start your day, sit down and think about three to five things that would make it a successful day for you. They don't have to be huge things. They can be really quite small things that make you happy. So I had uh, going for a short walk, um, cleaning my coffee jug. And I, it sounds ridiculous, but I have a latte every morning and the coffee jug doesn't go, the latte making, the milk um, jug thing doesn't go in the dishwasher. And so I have to hand wash it mm -hmm. and I can never yeah. be bothered. And I would <laughs> put soapy water in it and just leave it for next day until I need to use it. But then every morning I have to wash it before I use it. And what would make my day is if I didn't have to do that in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a small thing, right? If I wash my coffee jug today, then tomorrow will be, it'll help me for tomorrow. It can mm -hmm. be taking the trash out. It can be small things, but it helps mm -hmm. you to kind of, I guess, set a bit of an intention for your day um, and to think straight mm -hmm. away, okay, what, you know, it doesn't have to be big, but what will help me get through the day today? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I like, I like that. Um, would you say that they need to be things that you can control? Because like, for me, I feel like, the the main thing that makes me have a good day is when I wake up in the morning and it's sunny <laughs> like if yeah. it's good weather mm, bless you. it's yeah. gonna be a good day but obviously I can't I can't decide okay today it's gonna be I'm gonna make sure it's sunny <laughs> I, no I agree with you they need to be things that you can control that you and it's help get, it helps to give you a little bit more of a sense of control over your life um, and how mm. good your day is going to be and then all the extra stuff all the positive stuff that happens that you don't have control over it's bonus <laughs> Yeah. Um, but if we if we think about the psychology of it a little bit more, in terms of managing emotions, when you're dealing with a particularly emotional listening text, the psychology literature suggests that reappraising the situation is really helpful. So it's a bit of a mm -hmm. mindset shift. So uh, it's reappraising. So they call it the reappraisal strategy. It's about thinking about a situation in a way that decreases its intensity or makes it less negative for you. So one example would be if you've got to translate a really difficult text like you you had to do or, you know, a text about genocide or something like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, telling yourself, okay, this is going to be horrible. I'm, I'm going to find this really, really difficult, but it's going to help a lot of people. Uh, I'm doing it for a client so that they can spread the word in another language culture. So it's kind of reappraising it in a way to, to see the positive outcome of it or mm -hmm. yeah to, to think about not suppressing the, the negative aspects acknowledging them and saying okay this is going to be hard I'm going to going to need to take lots of breaks from this text but also thinking about you know what's the upside of this and that that can help people kind of get through it so I guess that's a more practical translation related strategy that one can use. Mm -hmm. I like I like that idea because like you said earlier how like your mood or your emotions aren't necessarily just one thing and I guess if you can feel you feel upset or 
distress with whatever you're translating if you can look at the overall picture and also feel positive at the same time I guess it makes the stressful upsetting part a bit smaller yeah in a way and it takes practice it doesn't always Mm -hmm. work immediately or for that particular text but if you kind of get into the practice of of rethinking about things slightly differently then that can be helpful in the long run but it's a it's a continuous you always have to work on yourself (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's not something that you learn to do and then you can kind of easily do it and you have no negative emotions. That's that's not how it works, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any other kind of like things that we can do as translators to sort of manage our moods and emotions and things? Yeah, another thing that kind of springs to mind is relationships. Um, So it's been shown that connecting with other people and connecting with a community is really important um, Mm -hmm. for overall well-being. So I know that some professional associations offer kind of mentoring opportunities. There are networking events. So all of these kinds of social activities can be really helpful in making you feel happier generally. I always recommend coaching as well. Mm -hmm. I see this as part of career development. Getting some coaching from someone who's kind of external to your context can be really eye-opening and helpful. So that's always something to think about. It doesn't have to be, you know, a long-term commitment. You can get, you know, some career coaching, maybe four or five sessions. Um, Sometimes if you're going through a difficult time, that can be really useful. And then I was wondering if you'd heard of job crafting before. Oh, I've not. What's that? (laughs) That's something that I've come across quite recently in the literature. And yeah, so job crafting is basically altering your job to make it more energizing, more engaging or more meaningful. So it kind Mm -hmm. of involves redesigning your job to incorporate your values, your motives, your passions. So again, it means kind of taking time out to think about, you know, what tasks you enjoy you'd like to do more often or thinking about ways to change your current interactions with other people in your job, or a way to make something that currently you're finding very complicated and annoying easier. Um, So it's about making kind of thoughtful changes to help you make the most of your strengths and your values, um, Mm -hmm. and to bring you more work opportunities that align with that. Um, So job crafting, I think. Yeah, it's quite an interesting one. Um, Yeah. Yeah, and there's some kind of um, articles out there. If you you know, if you Google job crafting, there are quite a lot of uh, articles around that that kind of explain it a bit more and and how you can yeah. do that. And there are like spread like not spreadsheets, sorry, worksheets that you can download to help you think through how to job craft. I think that's oh, I love it because yeah. it's something that I kind of have talked about quite a bit, but I didn't know it had a I didn't know it had a name. As in, like I said about like as freelancers, like it is. I think it's important that we make our jobs what we want them to be. And the fact that we chose to be freelance, well, it, like we might as well make the most of that and make the most of having the freedom to choose who we work with and what we work on and how we work and everything. And like, it's something that I am like aware of a lot. Like I'm, I, I like having a lot of social interaction. So like, I'm a big fan of the like translator community on LinkedIn, on Instagram. I love going to like conferences and getting to like chat to people and you know going to events and I'm part of my uh, local translation network as well and I just love like going to co-working or even just arranging co-working sessions with like other translators in my area like in our in our houses or like (laughs) with other friends that I have that also just work from home and like that makes like a massive difference for me so I do think like it's um it's important and that we can like make it what we want it to be so I'm definitely going to have a look at um job was it job crafting yeah job crafting as a concept I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, really <laughs> do it sounds like you're already doing a lot of that so um <laughs> yeah no that's yeah that's really good I think you know every everyone will figure it out differently um and I think one thing that I've certainly kind of learned is that all jobs have the potential to trigger positive and negative emotions and mm-hmm. it's not something that we should necessarily run away from, but it, it's, you know, about finding balance and thinking about what will make the job rewarding for you personally. And I think you, you've totally done that, um, <laughs> which is which is really nice. And, and but I, you know, I, I not everyone does that. And 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 it's something that needs to be done, I think, at various 
points of your career um, when you start mm-hmm. out, but then, you know, once you're experienced, often you think, oh, you know, that's I know what I'm doing, and then something happens, and you're just not prepared for it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so yeah. yeah, and and you know, I I mean, I don't feel that I have any kind of advice to give really to the translator community, but one thing that I've certainly learned from experience is to really kind of be a little bit critical of some of the narratives out there as well you know not to accept everything um Mm -hmm. it seems obvious but um you know one of the ones that we often have in academia and I think there is in translation as well to some extent is this idea that translation is a labor of love um and demands sacrifices but it's important to remember that your job is not who you are it's what you do um Mm -hmm. and I think that's you know that's an important thing to to think about when you are translating or when you are working with clients and you know it's great to have a greater purpose and to have dedication that's really admirable but it shouldn't push you to work past your limits to accept any job and I realized that um, and as you were saying earlier that comes from kind of a privileged position to say you know you can refuse jobs because obviously you can't necessarily to start with Um, Mm -hmm. it's not easy to refuse opportunities when you're just starting out I get that but I think at least my aim is to kind of raise awareness as much as possible around emotions so that as many translators as possible can kind of actively find the tools that work for them to be able mm-hmm. to cope and not just cope, but to thrive um, in the translation profession. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I do think like it's a balance as well. Like there is obviously going to be some bits that you don't enjoy doing and I don't enjoy having to do fill in my tax returns and all of this but like obviously no, <laughs> it needs to you know it needs to happen and like I'm still kind of trying to find that balance of doing the bits I enjoy and then the other bits that I have to do because I can't just go off to every single translation conference when they're like often hundreds of pounds and you know I have to yeah. <laughs> I have to look at my you know my finances and be like okay I do actually need to also do some paid work if I want to be able to of course <laughs> do like all these things and things like co-working like I love co-working but I'm never quite as productive on those days as I am when I'm working on my own at home because obviously I want to chat to whoever I'm with and I want to you know so it's kind of like (laughs) yeah I think it's about finding the balance as well maybe yeah what works for you and that's you know that comes with experience sometimes as well you know you try different things and some things work out some things don't work out and that's fine you know and it's not being too hard on yourself trying something Mm -hmm. think oh that didn't work for me at all I'm gonna throw it you know the baby out with the bathwater. no well maybe you'll try (laughs) something different down the line and even if something doesn't work you've learned something from that Mm -hmm. you know um and it's about kind of digging deep and and thinking okay why does this not work for me what are the reasons how did I react how can I do things differently in future what support do I need to help me through it um Mm -hmm. so it's kind of having yeah having that level of reflection which you know life is busy we often don't think about things (laughs) um but yeah it's building that into our work I guess Mm -hmm. So obviously I've seen you've done um, quite a few publications with your research research and stuff. Which ones would you recommend my listeners to go and have a read of if they want to learn more about your research and your findings? Or can you also say a bit more about your course that you mentioned as well? Yeah, I mean, I I think in the the show notes you'll you'll manage to put a link, which is to um, a website that I created a couple of years ago where I'm putting together like resources on uh, translation and emotions. And so, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, my articles, I guess the open access ones are on there, for instance. So the ones that are easy, that are short and kind of easier to, to get access to. I'm, of course, also happy to share any kind of preprint version of any of my articles. So if something is particularly interesting I'm, I'm very happy for people to contact me and to send it but mm-hmm. um on that on that website uh full of resources I think what's much more interesting are all the kind of brilliant articles by translators themselves um on these topics and and 
because they share their experiences, they share how emotions impact their work, and it can impact their work that they do, but also the context in which they work. So the text itself, but also the environment. And so mm-hmm. I'm collecting. So if anyone out there has more ideas of, of um, you know, of, of writings that I can add to that resource website, I'm more than happy to do that. But there are some really, really brilliant um, translators who wrote about their experiences that I think people could read. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's also a link to um, two short courses. So, well, one short course and one long course. So I've designed a short course, like a two hour course on emotional intelligence for translators, which um, is designed for freelance translators. It will also work for, for translators who work in-house, but it was designed with freelancers in mind. And that's just kind of a two-hour introduction to some of these tools. So some of these coaching tools that I discussed today, um, it helps you reflect around some of the issues that you might be encountering in your work. And it also includes um, extracts to kind of raise awareness around some of these issues. So extracts from articles and from the literature. So yeah, that's kind of a, it's a short CPD. And then the other course is a much longer course. It's an 18 hour kind of training package. And that one is designed for um, organizations who recruit translators. So it can be Mm -hmm. licensed and then given a staff development. Um, oh, yeah, okay. so I hope they're helpful. I mean, my my idea is to is to raise awareness and to, and to, yeah, create some resources that can be of practical help to translators. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they will be. I'm definitely going to have a have a proper look after this myself. So, <laughs> yay! <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share today with everyone that's listening? Um, no, I don't think so. Just um, you know, if you do want to get in touch like to pursue a conversation um then i'm i'm on linkedin so very happy to to receive messages on there and also if you google me you'll find my institutional email address and i'm I'm happy to to get queries on there and uh, yeah to i don't know to converse oh. further <laughs> <laughs> thank you i'll put um i'll put a link to your linkedin profile in the show notes as well so it's easy for people Perfect. to find you and contact you if they want to Perfect. Um, Thank you so much but yeah, for thank you. And your input. <laughs> thank you so much for being on my podcast and chatting to me today. It's been it's been really, really interesting and I'm sure a lot of translators listening to this will find it really useful. Oh, I hope so. And thank you for inviting me. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Meet the Translator podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed chatting to Severine. Make sure to check out the show notes for resource links and Severine's LinkedIn profile. If you have any comments or questions about the podcast, please send an email to meetthetranslator at gmail.com.